Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I am at Chabot Space Science Centre with Ben Burris. And Ben is here to show me the interior of the Soyuz capsule they have on display. So the Soyuz here is a 7K OK, which is pretty much the earliest Soyuz that flew in space. Uh, yeah, and this has a really fascinating story because we don't really know the origin of this one. Well, Russia. <laughs> Russia, okay. Uh, that's a pretty um, safe bet. Right, yeah. We bought uh, this spacecraft and a bunch of spacesuits and other space paraphernalia from uh, Russia some years ago, but it didn't come with a lot of documentation. So we don't know if this one ever flew. We had it x-rayed and we, we saw retro rockets under the heat shield, which ah. is a clue that maybe it was in line to fly. It was certainly came out of the factory fully formed, right? Right, exactly. But as far as I know, the one bit that we do know that actually flew is the control panel. You know, I'm not sure about, I, personally, I don't know that, but... Uh, I yeah. heard that somebody looked at the serial numbers and it matched okay. up to one of the Cosmos uncrewed missions. So maybe a piece of this maybe flew a piece space, of this flew nice. right, and so that might just be a sign that yeah. this may never actually have properly flown. But it is like a fifty-year-old Soyuz, right? Uh, that would be about right. That would be about pretty much right. Yeah, they because they only flew until nineteen seventy-one. Right, exactly. So. The seven K OK stopped flying in nineteen seventy-one after a rather unfortunate uh, decompression accident. Yeah, and uh, so that actually I should point out while there are spacesuits in here. The real 7K OK never flew with spacesuits. Right. Uh, and when they fixed it up to fly after that, they took one of the seats in there and they put the life support hardware for the so called spacesuits. But I mean, this, so this sat outside for a long time. This was on display. Right. Georgia, I heard? I believe Georgia. Uh, we have a picture of it next to a full Soyuz spacecraft, both mounted so, outside. Right, so this is yeah. just the descent module. That's right. So Soyuz comes in three parts. You have the descent module with the crew uh, take off and everything. There's the service module on the back that has the propulsion, the power, solar panels. And on the front, they have the orbit module. The orbit module gives the crew a place to stretch their legs and use the bathroom and uh, dock with spacecraft. So yeah, this has been on display here for like a decade or so. And yeah. <laughs> Well, this is its uh, second exhibit that it's been in. It's the one piece that stayed from the previous exhibit. It's all new around us except for the, the Oh, right, because you guys, yes. And, but you do have like a bunch of suits. I see there's an Orland space suit through there and right. there's a... We have the mirror uh, toilet. Oh, yes. Space toilet. toilet yes. Uh, backup engineering model, at least. And there's a mock-up or a replica of Gagarin's suit I saw as well. The, uh, right, the ejector seat. The ejector the seat and suit, yes. Have that. That's actually a real training suit, we learned. It's not a, a mock-up suit. Oh, it's a the real ejection working... ejection seat is, is a mock-up. Is a mock-up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. So, Soyuz is also interesting because it was derived from Vostok. It flew on the same R7 rocket. And that led to its very cramped design because they couldn't really make it much wider due to the fact that they were restricted by the size of the rocket. Mm -hmm. And the Soyuz is not a cone shape like American capsules because uh, a sphere has much better surface area to volume ratio, right? So they come up with this weird headlamp shape that allows them to <laughs> sort of fly it through entry. A sphere is perfect, but sphere would have very high re-entry loads because you can't fly it. Right. Okay, so obviously we are outside the exhibit right now. I'm just going to do a walk around of the capsule so you can see the shape here. As I said, it has this kind of headlamp shape and the, the flat-ish bottom there means that they can fly aerodynamically through re-entry. This one still has a re-entry heat shield in place. Now, that might mean that it never flew or it might mean that they replaced the heat shield afterwards. Under this, there would be various, uh, the, the landing rockets, the radiation sensors the, the, that would actually, you know, uh, detect they were close to the ground. And it would also include three wrenches to open the hatch with a sign saying, uh, cosmonauts in trouble inside and included instructions how to get out. Sounds very practical to me. <laughs> So you can actually see the vent nozzles here for the uh, guidance system, for the steering. Not much of a window here. But yeah, so you, you haven't repainted this or anything. This is the, the way We did not came. repaint it, but we don't know what the provenance was in, in Russia. You know, <laughs> they did have it on display outside, so I wouldn't it, be surprised if they gave it a coat. To something. give it some protection from right. the elements, right? Mm -hmm. So here's one of those exhaust ports there. Obviously a bit 
a bit smaller than two meters. But right under here, this is the cool part, this is where the periscope would go, right? So this actually has a light channel that goes all the way up into the cockpit. And there's an instrument in there which is basically a fancy periscope that lets them control their, uh, that lets them see whether they're pointing the correct way or not. So on top here, you can see on the right, that is where the main parachute would be. And that, that basically runs all the way down inside there. You can see that's a big long cavity. On the left side, that is still on there. Now that side has a smaller emergency chute. And at the bottom, it also contains the peroxide tanks for the reaction control thrusters. Now, uh, the reason that it's in there is because, of course, peroxide is pretty scary stuff, and they didn't want to have it inside the crew cabin. That was a Korolev decision. And now we can actually proceed inside the cockpit. And as I said, we have three so-called suits in here. This one in the middle is not a flown suit. This was a Colin Prescott in QI Night Q balloon. He tried to, they wanted to set an altitude record, but unfortunately their balloon burst before it managed to get far off the ground. But there is not much room in here at all. So obviously these cavities at the side have taken up a lot of the room. And you'll notice by the way that there's no lining on this spacecraft. Like there's usually like a, I think it's a fabric lining. Well, in this case, it's all exposed and all this brown stuff, this is the adhesive that held it in place. It's not rust, which I kind of naturally presume. I thought it was rust, but then realized the spacecraft is aluminium, so therefore that shouldn't rust. But the good news is that while it's not authentic, because we're missing that, we can see stuff like these interior welds, and there's a whole bunch of you know, plumbing and wiring that we would otherwise be unable to see. You can see the details in this tiny little window here that they will use to look out. To the world. Look at the screws on that. Uh, obviously would be normally held in place by air pressure from the inside as well as, you know, a whole bunch of screws. Oh, look, there's some writing there. But yeah, you can actually see out the outside to, I don't know. Well, ideally you shouldn't see the Earth from there unless you look down. Now this, this is how you would actually see the Earth. This is the visor instrument and this connects to the periscope. So... That in the middle should be like a window that goes straight down. And around the outside, there are eight petals that look out towards the Earth's horizon. So if there's the little bit of the horizon in all eight of those petals, then the spacecraft is pointed straight down. And you can also tell which way you are moving by looking at that. So that's how you would align the spacecraft for re-entry if, say, there was a problem that, you know, if the automated systems went offline or whatever. And that's actually a holdover from Vostok. This here... This is your little navigation orbit calculator computer thing. And yeah, I mean, obviously you'd set up your orbital parameters and then it would run forwards in time. And apparently there's a way in this to get it to predict your landing site if you perform the re-entry burn at this specific time. I'd love to take this apart, but I don't think the museum would let us. This is your status panel. All these lights come on. Sorry about the shaky camera. I really would love to see more of that stuff. Okay, so I think this here is part of the plumbing to the reaction control thrusters. That's the thruster. On the other side of that is the thruster that controls pitch. And uh, obviously the plumbing isn't there, but that would bring hydrogen peroxide in. And here, this, this here is a TV camera, which uh, is interesting. OKC110T. Okay, number 134. I'm not sure why they would have a TV camera on a capsule that didn't fly with a crew. But hey, um, yeah, what else can we see around here? I think, there, yeah, there's a couple of other places where you have the plumbing and the peroxide thrusters, but, oh yes, hold on. Now this, um, P pulse, pulse meter. Ah, this, these are two pulse meters. A, there must be a third one because there's three crew in here. Uh, that's presumably to tell the crew whether they are freaking the heck out or not. Let me see. Um, da, da, da. SKDU. See those are red keys there? SKDU was the propulsion system. So that would be part of the like you know, on-orbit you know, thruster. This looks like a panel which has electrical and temperature on it, which is pretty... Okay, I can recognize that. Uh, this here is the clock. And what do we see here? The Vremya 
Pleta, uh, flight time. That will be our flight time. And this, oh, hold on, bring it around. Oh, what's that? Okay. Something here. Scorost. Oh, meters per second. So I'm guessing that is my speed in meters per second. Look, I'm learning Russian because I can read the alphabet, huh? I can certainly understand the numbers, but the letters are a whole lot harder. Okay, so, yeah, this is the stainless steel, like, I don't know. This is basically the hatch between the descent module and the orbit module. This isn't a docking door or anything. This is just a hatch that uh, has to handle the heat of re-entry. You see that it's all made of, um, you know, stainless steel. And there's the control panel. Now, that hatch is getting in the way, but you can see it from the other side from this... Um, you know, from, from this hatch, from this window in the side there, there's a whole panel down there. Um, maybe I can get a camera in over the top. That's, that's what I'm trying to figure out how to do that, to see if there's anything worth seeing. Okay, here we go. We're going to move the camera over the top, and we can now see... I have no idea what half this stuff is in here, <laughs> but we can see there's a lot of... Oh, God, I would I would give so much to just spend ages actually looking at this. I would love to do a live stream from inside this, discussing all the different bits of hardware. Uh, <laughs> but this was just an opportunity that came up. There's the visor. Better view of it from this side. This is actually amazing to get my head inside one of these things. It's yeah. like the, one of the oldest spacecraft that you can look at the interior of. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I think, I don't, how many other examples like this are there in the world? There's not many. Of uh, Soyuz? 7K OK? Good question. In That you can it, stick your head in? This might that. be a unique. They made a lot of them because it was an assembly line, you know, manufacturing yeah. bases, but what happens to them after they land? I mean, the, I, various things, I imagine. Yeah, I, I think they get crushed <laughs> so that their secrets never made it out to the West. <laughs> well, how did this one survive then? Ah, because yeah. they wanted to put it on display to show their right. great Soviet workmanship. <laughs> but yes, anyway, this has been amazing. <laughs> and I hope you've really enjoyed looking around inside this. Thanks, Ben. You're welcome. I hope I can come back. I'll let you know when we're opening it up again, right? <laughs> I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.